there'll be a million Israelis. A massive highway system that completely uh, uh, incorporates these settlements into Israel proper so that the whole country has been reconfigured and of course the wall as we all know the wall that's more than more than twice as high as the Berlin Wall and five times longer than the Berlin Wall was so it's you know for those of us a little bit older we remember that 30 years ago the Berlin Wall and apartheid were two of the most uh, uh, evil systems that we were trying to fight. Today you have both of those systems within little Palestine, both supported by the British government and the Americans and much of the international community. And that brings up the question that I'll talk about, how does Israel get away with this? How, how can that be? At any rate, uh, the wall of course came to literally in concrete confined the Palestinians to what Israel calls cantons. A canton in the north, a canton in the central of the West Bank, a canton in the south, and Gaza. And to incorporate these pink areas are the major what Israel calls its settlement blocks, where its large settlements are, to incorporate them inside Israel, including of course East Jerusalem. So when you put this together, what you get is uh, the end of the two-state solution. It's been eliminated and it's gone and we should forget about it. Where we are today is apartheid. There is, I mean, it's not just a slogan that we, that we yell at demonstrations. There is a new apartheid regime. And apartheid is an easy system to explain. Um, in international law, it's basically two elements. Because if anybody says to you it's not apartheid, it's not racial, it's not like South Africa, there's not the system uh, of apartheid uh, has two elements to it. One is separation. That's what apart means. Apartheid is separateness. When one population separates itself from the others. And all you have to do is look at the Israeli flag, and you can see that that's obviously the case. And the second element is domination. In other words, when one population separates itself from the others and then creates a regime of permanent institutionalized domination. It's not just discrimination. You have discrimination everywhere. But it's when the regime, when the laws, um, when, the, when the whole principle of the country is based on privileging one group over others. One group has more rights, and obviously one group dominates the others in a legal, institutionalized kind of a way. And we have apartheid today. And it's so that I would argue not only is the two-state solution gone, but there is one state today. In other words, this whole discussion, should there be one state or two states, is over. It's resolved. There is one state. There is one state in existence between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. So when we say free Palestine from the, from the, from the sea to the river, I mean, we already have, well, we don't have a free Palestine, but we've already got from the sea to the river. And that is one country that today is Israel over the Palestinians in an apartheid situation. It's clear that, um, that there's only one government in this entire country. You can, don't tell me the Palestinian Authority is an effective functioning government with authority. There's only one army, actually. Or in fact, there's one and a half armies because the PA's militia is basically a branch of the Israeli army. Um, there's only one water system, one electrical system, one highway system, one currency. Whether you're in Tel Aviv or, or, or Gaza or Hebron, you're using the shekel, which is controlled by the Bank of Israel. So by every measure, there already is one country here, and that's an apartheid country. And Israel believes that it can get away with apartheid in the way that South Africa couldn't. Um, and if you look at your government's policies, I mean, maybe they're right. Although that's, of course, something that we're, that we're all fighting. 
So <clears throat> I think today, with what's happening, um, uh, from Israel's point of view, uh, what it's doing today is mopping up operations. It's, from Israel's point of view, it's over. It's finished. We've achieved apartheid. The Palestinians have been confined to these little enclaves of Bantustan. And basically, whatever violence, and we use the word violence, which is a very apolitical term, uh, whatever violence exists is the last gasp from Israel's point of view of any kind of resistance. Uh, of course, what makes it worse is that the Palestinians feel they're living under two occupations. Their own Palestinian authority is a collaborationist regime, which makes it even more difficult for them to, to, uh, to, uh, to resist. And I would say that Israel's message today, to the, if you look at the, at the repressive measures that have been taken, an increase in house demolitions. Israel has demolished 46,000 Palestinian homes, roughly, in the occupied territory since 1967. That's going to be increased. The Israeli government decided the other day that it's going to do that. Uh, the arresting of hundreds of kids. Because basically we're talking about little children and youth that are resisting today. It's not organized. Um, uh, and it's almost a kind of a self-defense in a way. Because, because the Palestinians feel so imposed upon. In other words, you don't have any distance anymore. The settlers are on top of them. The army's on top of them. The PA militias are on top of them. And it's like, you know, if I'm, if I, you know, if, if, a, if a policeman or somebody comes like, you know, your tendency, your instinct is to push back. And I think this is, in a sense, it's a pushback on the part, especially of Palestinian kids that just have no more space uh, to breathe. Um, I think Israel's message to the Palestinians is this. You have three options. There's no more peace process. There's no more political process at all. You're not a side. You're not Palestinians. We don't recognize you as a national group with, with national rights. You're a bunch of Arabs. And basically you're inmates in our prison. And you have, you Arabs, because we don't use the word Palestinians in Israel. You Arabs today have three choices. You can submit. If you submit and you simply live in your prisons, you live in your prisons, you accept the fact that this is a Jewish country, and of course Israel and Obama has accepted this. Bush rejected this thing, but Obama accepted the idea that for any negotiations to, to begin, the Palestinians have to recognize not the state of Israel. They did that 30 years ago. They have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Which means, in a sense, the Palestinians have to become Zionists before any negotiations go on, which is the policy of the United States. So that you have to recognize that this country, basically, is Jewish, you have no rights here. You're not Palestinians. You're a bunch of Arabs. And if you shut up and you know your place and submit, we'll let you live here. Or you can leave. You know, it's a prison, but the back door is open. You know, you can leave the West Bank through Jordan, wherever you want to go. You can leave Gaza through Egypt to wherever you want to go. And we'll facilitate that even. But you can leave. Or you die. And that's the message today, especially to the young people. You submit, you leave, or you die. And it's a very dire option. A very dire kind of scenario for Palestinians. And I think that's, that's part of the resistance today. But it's true, the resistance is getting weaker and weaker on the ground. It's very hard for the Palestinians to, to hold on. And that's why working here in Edinburgh and abroad, this is so important. Because this is what gives that, the Palestinians, I think, that lifeline. 
So that uh, so we have to we have to uh, uh, keep that up, but at the same time, what I'm trying to urge our Palestinian partners is we've got to start formulating our own solution. We've got to start advocating for something, not just end the occupation. What is end the occupation? End, it could end and something worse could replace it. We have to begin to advocate, I think, but I'm just speaking alone because there's no agreement on the part of our Palestinian partners. I think we have to start advocating for a single state, one democratic state, that's binational. Because there are two national groups in that country, and that's where you'll get a lot of pushback from Palestinians. That say, if we recognize Israeli Jews as a national group in a binational country, you're asking us to legitimize colonialism or legitimize Zionism. There's a lot of pushback, and, there's all, and it's also very hard for the Palestinians, for our partners, because they're caught between a rock and a hard place. You know, as inadequate as a two-state solution might have been, it is the culmination of a national liberation struggle. I mean, maybe not from the sea to the river, but getting a, even a small Palestinian state gives you a certain modicum of self-determination. You're in the international community. There's a Palestinian state and a flag. Once you give that up, you're giving up a national liberation struggle in a sense. And the problem is that, that um, um, uh, you know, they, I mean, I think the Palestinians know that the two-state solution is gone, but abandoning it has really Im tremendous implications for the whole nature of the Palestinian struggle, which is national liberation. And if you begin to move towards a one-state solution, one democratic binational state, you're in a sense transforming your national movement into a civil rights movement. And now you're locked into one state with your oppressors, um, in some ways there's some dangers because the Israelis are stronger institutionally, educationally, economically than the Palestinians and so there's a danger of becoming an underclass. It's not an easy, I think, move for the Palestinians to do. As a matter of fact, many Palestinians my age or even younger say we can't do that. We can't make that, that transformation. It's going to be up and you hear this more and more. It's up to the young generation of Palestinians, 10, 20 years down the line, to go through that transformation and, 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 and continue the struggle. Well, uh, maybe, but I certainly don't want to wait 10 or 20 years, you know, for something maybe to emerge. For me, as an old 60s radical, I'm like a museum piece, um, to be in a political struggle without having an end game, without having a solution that you're pushing for, is a very weak place to be. You know, people can ask us genuinely, okay, you're against the occupation, you're against apartheid, you're, what are you for? What do you want? And we don't have a clear answer. And again, I'm trying to gently push our Palestinian partners because we can't give that answer. It's up to the Palestinians to lead, to lead in that way, and for all kinds of reasons, partly because of the fragmentation, that's, that's you know, the political fragmentation that's been, that's a, a deliberate struggle, of, a, a deliberate strategy of Israel and the international community, partly because Israel has had a systematic campaign for the last 70 years of, of either eliminating, killing, or imprisoning any Palestinian who shows leadership kinds of skills, whether you're 12 years older or older, um, all that has had a tremendous impact on the Palestinians. And the fact that they're living under a collaborationist regime, the Palestinian Authority certainly makes it even more difficult. So I think we're in a really tough, tough uh, place right now. Nevertheless, the good news is, of course, that I think the Palestinian struggle has reached the proportions of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, all over the world. 
And I think public opinion has changed. And government policies could change. What's missing again is our agency. What's missing is a clear voice coming from the Palestinians, from critical Israelis, and from you then, saying this is where we want to go. Uh, so I'm trying to advocate to link BDS to an end game. Um, you know, so I, I'll offer you a slogan. I made up a slogan, and it's so cute that I have to share it with you. <laughs> Even though we're not there yet, it's where I would like to see us go, because I think it would make our movement more directed and, and, and stronger. Because it, it's not enough just to mobilize people, which we've, I think we've done fairly successfully. We have to mobilize them in a certain direction, towards a certain goal, a demand. And that would be, if I had a slogan to sell you today, it would be BDS for BDS. Boycotts, divestment, sanctions for a binational democratic state. Huh? <laughs> Again, we're not there, and the Palestinians haven't moved to there, but I think we have to push them. And I, one more sentence before I go on, why I think this is so urgent. Because I think now, this might be more wishful thinking than analysis, but I think the Palestinian Authority um, is on borrowed time. I think it's in a state of collapse. The Palestinian Authority has lost all its credibility among its own people. Um, it has no money. Uh, 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 elections are impossible, partly because of the Fatah-Hamas split. Um, and, uh, and the PA is seen, I think, as a collaborationist regime. So I think what's going to happen, this is what I'm, I, 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 possibly. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, the Holy Land produces a lot of profits, but we're not always right. <laughs> and that is that I, what I foresee is a collapse of the present situation. I don't see the Palestinian Authority as being sustainable, and I don't think the, op the occupation is sustainable. So that if, you know, the silver lining in what's happening today, in the violence of today, is that if the, this kind of unorganized resistance on the part of Palestinian youth calls, calls a, 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 such a disproportionate Israeli reaction that we're, that we're seeing militarily and legally and so on, that it, it completely, uh, I don't know how to put this, because I don't know how you could do this more, not just humiliates the PA, but it could, push, it could push Abu Mazen out. In other words, he would have to be so blatantly collaborationist. And you see this, I mean, there's been videos out the last couple of weeks of Palestinian uh, militia people beating up Palestinians. I think if you get to a point, Abu Maz is at any rate on the way out. He's already resigned from his PLO positions. Um, it could be that this could be the trigger uh, that collapses the PA. Or that the PA, I think, could very easily disappear from the scene, whether collapse or resign in the next few months. Maybe tomorrow, who knows? If that happens, that's the game changer from my point of view. Then, in that vacuum, Israel would have to reoccupy the Palestinian cities, it would have to reoccupy Gaza, and it would create a completely untenable situation. Israel couldn't maintain it, I mean, even economically. How are you going to support four and a half million impoverished people with no infrastructure? Um, but in addition to that, I think, uh, it would create such violence and chaos and, and it would so inflame, I believe, not just the Arab and Muslim worlds, I think also Europe and other parts of the world, that it could well, if, we're, if we work with that, it could well force the hand of the international community. So what I'm saying is, today, a one-state solution is academic. I say to all my, I mean, I'm a professor of anthropology. It's kind of funny that... Uh, 
The word academic means irrelevant. <laughs> but that's... <laughs> But a one-state solution is academic today. A one-state solution is not going to happen, as long as the PA exists. But if the PA falls, and you have that opening, and you have that reoccupation, and so on, then the opportunity emerges for new thoughts, for new uh, approaches, new options that don't exist today, like the one-state option. And my great fear is that this collapse is going to happen, and it could happen soon, and we're not ready. We have nothing to offer. And if we, the progressive forces, don't have anything to offer, the bad guys have a million plans in the drawer. So we could indeed end the occupation and have something worse replace it. We have to be agents, and we're not today. We're, so far, we're agents opposing the occupation. We, we're not agents in terms of where do we want to go with it. And so that's what I, that's, from my point of view, the meaning of this violence in the sense that we have today. And that is that this is a part of the collapse, part of Israel losing control, part of the PA losing control. But what happens if that game changer takes place and we have nothing really positive to to contribute. So those are just some of my thoughts. Um, <laughs> this is before I'm giving the talk. <laughs> now the hour begins. <laughs> You've got 15 minutes. Yeah, OK, OK. <laughs> so but one of the questions really is, as we've asked, how does Israel get away with this? With an apartheid regime, with the violence, you know, uh, 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 violating international law, human rights, the brutality. And in, in some ways, in opposition to international public opinion. I mean, the British government, you know, on paper at least, is against the occupation and for a two-state solution. And the American government, you know, they're not, they're not doing anything. And of course, they're even enabling Israel. But the, one of the questions is why? And uh, that's been sort of nagging me uh, for a long time. And uh, the usual explanations didn't quite do it for me. You know, the Jewish lobby. Well, APAC has some clout in the United States. I don't think it has as much clout as people think it has. But it's, it's, it's a factor. Um, uh, but, uh, but I, it, I don't think it drives American foreign policy. And there's a lot of other countries that are super pro-Israel, like Poland or Egypt, for that matter, that don't have Jewish communities. All right, well, then people say, well, the Christian fundamentalists, Christian Zionists, you know, the Sarah Palins. Well, they have a certain role to play as well. In the Republican Party in the United States, Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister of Canada, is, a Christian, is, an, is an avowed Christian Zionist. You know, you've got in Holland, they have quite a bit of clout, actually. But a lot of other countries, including this country, I think, you know, they don't really have that much clout, Christian Zionists. Well, guilt over the Holocaust. Okay, and that might work in Germany to some degree. Germany has a special relationship with the Jews and Israel. But that, I don't know if that works here. It certainly doesn't work in the United States. Americans don't even know there was a Holocaust. It happened more than five years ago. <laughs> so, so those explanations, you know, even though they might play a certain role here and there, don't, you know, Kissinger, our friend Henry, used to say that countries don't have friends. They have interests. So I was trying to look at the interests here. What's, what's, what can really, in terms of interests, explain the support that Israel gets in the world? And that led me, led me, led me to the whole idea of what I call security politics. How a country parlays its military prowess into political clout. And instead of looking down, I mean, it's important to look down at the occupation. What is Israel doing to the Palestinians and so on? But it seemed to me that 
what it was doing to the Palestinians had very little to do with the Palestinians. The Palestinians aren't really an existential threat to Israel. You know, they're nothing more than a nuisance in a, in a kind of a security sense. You can't explain last summer's assault on Gaza, the summer of 2014, in military sense. The, the, the military threat that Hamas and its rockets uh, uh, were to Israel can't explain the disproportionate, massive military attack of, of artillery and naval ships and tanks and, I mean, weapons of, of warfare on this little Gaza. Something else was going on here. And it seemed to me that the Palestinians were the guinea pigs. They're not the end users. Rather, they're the ones that were trying weapons on. You've got 600 checkpoints in the West Bank. You've got millions of Palestinians passing through. No wonder Israel develops nice surveillance, nice, how's that for the name of a company? Nice systems that has the surveillance company that's surveilling uh, uh, Glasgow today. No wonder Israel's running your airports and training your police. I mean, they've got millions of Palestinians every day as guinea pigs for all kinds of, of surveillance technologies and so on. Gaza then and the, and the West Bank uh, become laboratories for the testing and perfecting of weapons, tactics, models of control. What I write about, I write about it in my book, what I call the matrix of control that Israel has laid over the occupied territories is exportable. It has certain elements to it.